to a live episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Walton. What's up, SCS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. And tonight, I can guarantee you, once again, you will not find a better panel on this subject anywhere. Try to find it. If you can send me a better panel, I'll give you your money back. Michigan jurors, after 11 hours of deliberations, found Jennifer Crumbly guilty of involuntary manslaughter uh, for the gun rampage committed by her son, Ethan Crumbly, who carried out the state's deadliest school shooting more than two years ago. Uh, Ethan was tried and convicted as an adult, but still prosecutors say that Jennifer Crumbly had a duty under Michigan law to prevent her son from harming others. She's accused of making a gun uh, and uh, a gun and ammunition and ammunition accessible at home and failing to get help for Ethan Crumbly, despite despite his pleas for help. Miss Crumbly's husband, James Crumbly, who is 47 years old, he is going to be tried separately in March. But the headline here convicted on four counts of involuntary manslaughter. Bottom left of your screen. Tony Montalto, he is the father of forever 14-year-old Gina Rose Montalto. She was a victim, very sadly, at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School back on Valentine's Day of all days, 2018. Tony is the president of Stand with Parkland. It is the National Association of Families for Safe Schools, an, adv an advocacy group founded by families that had a loved one killed in the Parkland, Florida school massacre. Then middle top is Ed McGovern, a friend of mine. He's founder and CEO of Sarah Software. He's a 22-year law enforcement veteran and police exec executive from South Florida. He retired as a major in the Hallandale Beach Police Department. Sarah, I'm going to do a show on this. C-E-R-A is a one-of-a-kind software uh, that helps prevent mass shootings and pinpoint the locations of shooters. Um, as well as the injured for paramedics in the uh, horrible case of a potential mass shooting. So he's developing software that can literally change the course of the world. Uh, next up, top right, David Gorsica is of counsel in the firm Jermarco Mullins and Horton in areas of criminal defense and civil litigation. Uh, he's a graduate of Michigan State University and the Detroit College of Law. And he was a prosecutor in Oakland County the county where all this went down, uh, leading an office of more than 100 assistant prosecuting attorneys. So no one knows this area where this uh, case was tried better than David Gorska. And last but not least, of course, everyone knows Josh Ritter, named the 2015 Outstanding Prosecutor of the Year by the Association of Deputy District Attorneys, now part of the El Dabe Ritter Trial Lawyers Law Firm. And he hosts the podcast True Crime Daily the sidebar, check it out if you haven't checked it out already. When you have the best guests in true crime, sometimes it takes a little while <clears throat> to get through uh, all of the bios, but here we are. Um, Tony, uh, first and foremost, condolences on the loss of uh, your daughter. I know you're joining us uh, just for a short time. Um, your reaction to the guilty verdict today, uh, do you think it's a game changer? Well, we hope that uh, it does uh, help show that there needs to be accountability. Um, I happen to be in uh, in one of the house office buildings today with uh, two other families, uh, Phil Shentrup, whose daughter Carmen was murdered in Parkland, as well as uh, Tom and Gina Hoyer, whose son Luke was murdered. And uh, we were, uh, you know, pleased to see the verdict, uh, pleased to see that this jury chose to uh, hold someone accountable who could have quite frankly, saved the lives of the four victims. Um, for our families, it's always important to remember the victims that were taken in these tragedies. Um, so we believe it's a step in the right direction. Uh, one of the founding principles of Stand With Parkland has been uh, responsible firearms ownership. And uh, we don't believe that this family exercised that uh, as far as our definition goes. It's pretty simple what we use. We say someplace where it's not going to be accessed by children 
and someplace where it's not likely to be stolen. Uh, and we believe if you want the right to own the firearm, then you need to be safe with it and keep uh, others safe. And that's what uh, sadly Mrs. Crumbly failed to do. And that's exactly what happened in this case. And uh, here is uh, Tony's beloved daughter, uh, Gina Rose. Uh, look at that beautiful face, uh, obviously taken uh, from us way, way too soon by the hands of another uh, mass shooter. So, um, you know, it's just devastating. And I've talked to Fred Guttenberg and um, many other uh, Parkland parents having reported down here. And uh, it never gets easy talking to the parents uh, and God forbid uh, any one of us who are parents could potentially be in their shoes. Kudos to Ed McGovern for uh, at least trying to solve the problem with Sarah software. These are the victims of the shooting uh, in Oakland County. These are the victims of Ethan Crumbly. You see Hannah St. Juliana, Tate Meyer, Justin Schilling, Madison uh, Baldwin. Uh, Dave Gorsica, this is a, uh, a first of its kind uh, precedent setting case here. Were you surprised um, by the conviction across the board here by the jurors there in Oakland County, your former county? Not really. Uh, if you look at the totality of the circumstances, you have an individual, Ethan, was 15 years of age, was literally crying out for help from his parents. He was saying, he was telling mom and dad, I, I have hallucinations, I'm seeing demons. He was depressed. His grandma died. His best friend moved away. And then the day before, he was painting on a math assignment, uh, a picture of the gun, blood everywhere, help me, things of that nature. And knowing all of that, the mother and father disregarded all the red flags. And then and he had the audacity to go out and buy him a six-hour nine-millimeter, which he took to school. And then we know the obvious consequences. So... I think the jury looked at the facts of what led up to the shooting and the, the, the shooter's background. He literally was crying out the hell. He's texted his best friend. My mom and dad won't listen to me. I want to call 911 and get a doctor, but they will laugh at me uh, and I will get in trouble. Um, when he confronted his father, he said, suck it up, son. When he talked to his mom, the mom laughed it off. Knowing all this, you then go out and buy um, the gun, I think four or five days before the shooting. Mom takes him to the range, and then several days later, he goes into the school and commits this tragedy. It's it's horrific, and I know the mother uh, was calling him um, a weirdo, basically saying her own son was weird, didn't like to speak about him, and it sounds like um you know she was avoiding the issue uh quantum here wannabe telling me it is not a precedent setting case josh Ritter, am i wrong about this well i think it is a precedent setting case i, I don't think it's um the first case that we've seen where uh, parents are being held responsible um but usually those cases have to do with some sort of negligent parenting I think this is, is, as far as I know, where parents are being held responsible for the independent actions of their child. Um, and what I mean by that is no, no one is alleging in this case that the Crumbleys, the parents, were anywhere near the school at that time. No one's alleging that they were involved in the planning or execution of this horrible, horrible shooting. But it's just that they didn't take the actions that they should have taken. Um, knowing what they did know and 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 knowing what they should have foreseen, they didn't take the proper actions to do something to have prevented this. but where it where it's unique and where I believe it does make precedent is that it's saying that even though Ethan Crumbly independently took it upon himself to execute this shooting, they are being held responsible for the murders as involuntary manslaughter. They're being held responsible for the deaths because they could have done something to pre prevent it. So I, I do think it's a remarkable case. I think the legal community is going to be, um, uh, you know, there's going to be reverberations from this for some time. 
Um, but I think it all came down to, as uh, uh, Tony um, pointed out, and, and thank you again, sir, for giving us your time, that it really comes down to the access and storage of this weapon. I, I believe that was the one of the crucial, if not the most crucial element in this, is that it's one thing if your child is having mental issues and it's difficult being a parent and you got your hands full and everything else, but when you are the one who introduces the deadly weapon into that equation and then you're negligent in your storage and the ability for that child with mental problems to access that gun, that is really what pushed things over the edge in the prosecutor's minds and in the minds of the jurors today. Uh, Jill telling me, hey, you should have a defense attorney on the panel. I don't have one. I've got two. Josh Ritter and Dave <laughs> Borsko are both. You can be a former prosecutor and a current criminal defense attorney, and that is what they are. Ed McGovern, uh, we've got our bases covered here. Ed McGovern, out of uh, all of us, you're the only one. Not only did you respond to Parkland, but I, I happened to cover the Fort Lauderdale airport shooting when I was at Fox News Channel, uh, where I think six were killed there. What What's it like? in your shoes as a first responder, when you responded to Parkland, take us, most people have obviously never experienced anything close to that, but what was it like for you and how has it stuck with you? Probably the biggest takeaway for me is frustration. It, it, it's, it's frustrating on so many levels. It's frustrating because, you know, we can't move fast enough. We can't get ahead of things where we're, we're trying to get in to save lives and, and it just it just takes too long right now and that's frustrating on that level and then the aftermath is, is even more frustrating because it's it's only when you have the hindsight of 2020 that you see uh all the missed times when when this could have been prevented you know at the point where we're going it's already past prevention and now it's it's dealing with the issue at hand, but uh, and, and this is this is going to be a case that really highlights that uh, on, on the prevention side. When you see all of the missed opportunities, especially um, with the shooter's mother now being convicted and seeing the messages, seeing the information, uh, the biggest thing that stands out to me is when she was in this meeting, you know, before her and her husband were in this meeting with their son and the school right before the shooting, they had a key piece of information that nobody else knew. And that's their son had access to a gun. You know, they, they knew it. Not only did they know it, they, they let him have access to a gun and the school's specifically talking to them about him being a threat to the school. And they're withholding this key piece of information. And, and this is the, the moment where there could have been an intervention there. Uh, instead, it's just kind of blown off and it's another missed opportunity. We saw it in Parkland and we see missed opportunities in, in every single after action. Um, so the, it's probably the biggest takeaway. It's, it's the frustration on all sides, seeing what could have happened and what you could have done. And and then also that frustration in, in responding that you, you just were just not moving fast enough and, and we need to do we need to do better. And by the way, uh, that is the company name on Ed's shirt, Sarah. That is the software. And like I said, I'm going to do a show on it because what that software does is amazing. And what's even more amazing is that uh, schools don't want to pay for it. And it is very affordable. It's not uh, priced at a point where school districts, even small ones, can't afford it. But um, it's always about the almighty dollar and then the bottom line. Uh, Andy K, this question I uh, will send it to you, Tony. The NRA and others say gun discipline begins at home, that more stringent laws, penalties aren't needed. We can't have it both ways. Parents are responsible for their minor children. Your thoughts? Uh, well, I said it before. The parents are responsible. Uh, and we do need uh, people who own their firearms to be responsible with them, uh, which includes uh, you know, safe storage, which includes being the uh, subject uh, to, uh, quite frankly, red flag laws, which we passed in Florida, sadly, after the Parkland shooting, which have been used over 12,000 times in uh, just over five and a half years. Um, they've been used in our red counties, our blue counties, our, by law enforcement, uh, and it helps save lives. Uh, we know that. And that's something that Florida did with a uh, Republican-controlled House, Republican-controlled Senate, and governorship, because these common sense and preventative things are, are very important to use. Um, the stuff Ed brought out about the Crumleys being in the school, 
uh, just that morning prior to the shooting, of course, brings a point of the school not use uh, a technique that is, uh, is uh, a, that is put out by the uh, US Secret Service and the National Threat Assessment Center, which is a behavioral threat assessment. The behavioral threat assessment process requires a multidisciplinary team where school officials come together with mental health professionals, as well as law enforcement. And the synergy of that team looks at a child who's exhibiting troubling behavior, and then tries to connect that child with help before they resort to violence. The school clearly did not bring in the law enforcement part of that team. That was a missing link. Perhaps the law enforcement looks at uh, what the shooter was doing, uh, sees him squirming and says, we need to search your backpack or your locker, whichever it, it might have been there. But this this crucial opportunity that's to uh, use this uh, this tool, um, it, it just has to be corrected. It has to be something that we look for in this nation. Florida passed a law requiring behavioral threat assessment and management to be used in all our schools. As a matter of fact, just this year uh, in January, we rolled out a, a Florida specific model. So uh, there was a lot of opportunity to save these children and prevent this tragedy. Same way there was in Parkland. Um, one of the further laws we changed in Florida was to require a district-wide mental health coordinator in each school district so that they look at a child who's exhibiting these troubling behaviors and now he's getting help from the school, but we make sure that he's on the path for the best possible outcome. Uh, sadly, during the trial shooter in Parkland, everyone possible just kept kicking the can down the road. Tony, how are you? Uh, how are you doing uh, these bunch of years later, and your family? And where are you getting the uh, the energy and motivation to uh, move forward, especially uh, to fight for these uh, you know restrictions and laws that you are working towards? Well, I think we're as unfortunate as we are to have had our children or our spouses taken from us in the Parkland tragedy. We do have a, a, a kinship now with the other families. And uh, that's why we form Stand With Parkland because we know that we have to change the status quo. We know that uh, our method of using the uh, our school safety triad uh, of securing the campus, better mental health screening and support programs. And finally, if you choose to own one, responsible firearms ownership has allowed us to move forward with new laws and new policies. And each time we do that, it extends the legacy of my beautiful daughter, Gina, her schoolmates and her teachers that were taken nearly six years ago. Um, you know, I speak to Manuel Oliver and Max Schachter and Fred Guttenberg. And uh, like I said, every time I talk to you guys, there's absolutely nothing uh, one can really say other than we got to try to fix this problem uh, in this country. And it seems like we are a long way from doing that. Uh, David Gorsica from Anna Lissette, from what I read on this case, the school failed in a number of ways, including not checking the kid's backpack. He had a gun in his backpack. His parents were there that morning, or at least the mother was. Um, if so, they should be legally liable. Uh, what about the school? But also uh, my question to you, David, more importantly, is he was tried as an adult, Ethan Crumbly. Um, how do you square, uh, and this is a photo of Ethan and his parents, how, how, from a legal perspective, how do you square the fact that he was tried as, as an adult and then also holding the parents um, complicit in his actions as a minor? Well, in Michigan, uh, there's certain delineated crimes, most of them capital crimes, murder being at the top where you can try them as an adult but the that's phase one uh, the conviction phase the second phase is the best interest and that is where the judge determine what's in the best interest of the minor is it rehabilitation to the juvenile system or is it incarceration and a punitive route um, in this case based upon the facts and circumstances the judge decided that he posed a danger and threat moving uh, forward and was not likely to be rehabilitated and imposed a life sentence. But if I can back up um, to what Tony was saying, uh, the counselor did do a, a threat assessment. I'm not sure if it's exactly what Tony was referring to. And the counselor in just two days, and now mind you, the mother testified she was a helicopter mom. In two days, the counselor said, 
that he, in his opinion, that he had suicidal ideation was actually homicidal ideation. And he based that upon the day before the shooting in class, Ethan was looking at ammunition. And the parents were called to school the day before. The day of the shooting, he was looking at shooting videos and gun videos. They dragged him down to the office again, called the parents a second time in two days and said, we feel that your child, Ethan, needs some mental health treatment right now. We want you to take him from the school right now. And they both said, we can't. We have to go back to the work, which was untrue. Um, now, with respect to the, the gun being in the backpack, the parents failed to tell the school personnel about all the history and red flags leading up to this um, when they had ample opportunity to do so. They also failed to tell the uh, counselor and the principal that he had a gun and we had an, he had access to a gun. So either the school personnel or the parents should have grabbed the weapon or at least checked the backpack. But the parents should not have should not have left him in school to perpetrate this crime uh tony's time is limited so i'm going to bounce back to him and then uh the intricacies of this prosecution um need some breaking down so i'll turn to josh and david uh for that and then there's there, we're not going to get to everything tonight no way no how but uh we'll do our best to get to as much as we can ash uh with a uh super chat here we need to treat mental illness, Tony, as seriously as physical illness. If a child suffers severe neglect leading to sickness, shouldn't uh, CPS, uh, Child Protective Services, step in legally? What do you think about the mental health aspect of these students and uh, them needing treatment, Tony? Well, certainly we need to treat mental health in this country much more seriously than we have. Uh, the good news is that uh, following the pandemic, we have seen uh, a lot of people put a little more uh, effort and emphasis on that. Um, we saw and uh, we helped get the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act passed. Um, that uh, new law uh, created the or continued funding for the 988 Suicide Prevention Hotline. It uh, also, uh, we were told at a White House meeting last summer, that is going to provide money for 14,000 more mental health counselors in our nation's schools. Um, that's a big number. That's uh, uh, certainly a number that the pipeline probably can't fill right now, but uh, it, it's important that we have recognized this and that we are seeing these efforts get in to so we can get people the help they need before they resort to violence. Um, you know, I'll just say one thing. I, I saw you put up the, the picture of the shooter and his name, and we, we keep saying his name. And uh, for the victims of a school shooting like this, uh, we believe that there should be no notoriety for the perpetrators of these crimes. So we always ask uh, our media partners that they uh, use the name as little as possible and certainly try and limit uh, the showing of pictures. We understand when you're telling a story, you have to use it sometimes, but uh, please, we encourage everybody who reports on these terrible, terrible tragedies to not give these mass murderers the, notor the notoriety which they crave. Uh, additionally, the uh, National Threat Assessment Center in their Protecting America Schools report that came out in 2019 reported that uh, I believe it was more than two thirds of school shooters do have suicidal ideation. So that is a warning sign that he is a danger and not only to himself, but to others. Um, we need to look at these things uh, very seriously. Um, Stand with Parkland uh, on our uh, standwithparkland.org on our resources page. We have information about a program called the Columbia Protocol, which came out of Columbia University. Um, it's available as an app now on both uh, iPhones and Androids. And um, it's six simple questions that if somebody sees somebody who's having a bad day, they could just ask those questions and the app will guide you through your actions, depending on the answers to those six questions. Um, it's really important that we do take a step back and look at one another and have a little more kindness and compassion in this world, which is something that my beautiful daughter Gina exhibited every day of her life. But we need everyone to start taking a look at that and seeing how we could help each other. Uh, well said, and uh, I agree with you 100% about the images and the notoriety. Uh, sadly, when there's a story breaking, a lot of times uh, 
it's hard to avoid it, but I do agree with you. Um, Josh Ritter, uh, to you on this question, David kind of touched on it, but from your perspective, how much responsibility does the school have? I'm a high school teacher and always check backpacks. It's sad that we're at that stage or state in this country. Uh, the administration here seemed to be clueless. Uh, how much um, liability or responsibility should schools have in all this? I think that's an excellent question. And I think it's a question that uh, was not answered by the verdict today. I don't think that uh, a verdict holding um, uh, Jennifer Crumley responsible for involuntary manslaughter means that there's no liability or responsibility that falls uh, at the feet of the school as well. And that was something that was disturbing that came out over the course of the trial is that you did find out not only all the um, red flags that the parents were aware of and opportunities that they had to intervene and take steps to have perf perhaps prevented this, but all of the red flags and disturbing information that the school was aware of and opportunities that they had to uh, intervene and do something about it. And I think it was Ed that pointed out that it's, it's, it's chilling when you think about they were all sitting in the room when a, a decision could have been made to search his backpack or do something that very day and it wasn't done. And I think realizing that that opportunity to prevent this tragedy was missed is what infuriated prosecutors and likely uh, played a role in the minds of the jurors. But it doesn't just lie entirely at the feet of the parents that the school as well could have done something as simple as if they felt that the parents weren't paying enough attention, they felt that that 11 minute meeting wasn't long enough to 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 do something uh, important, or they felt that they should have taken him home with them. That doesn't mean the school couldn't have also taken it upon themselves to search him, to put him somewhere where they felt like he could have had a little more supervision. A lot of other things could have been done. And I think that that is a question that certainly I, I imagine lawyers are going to be looking into and perhaps prosecutors. Uh, Ed, this question's in your wheelhouse from Misdemeanor OG. And again, there's so many tentacles to the story and it's so far reaching. Um, we'll come back to it for sure because uh, we'll never get through it all today. But uh, Misdemeanor, who's in Europe, says, never arm teachers, please. In, emergency, in an emergency, I would follow the kids to safety, uh, not the teachers. What about arming um, teachers? There was talk of doing that at one point. Uh, what do you think of, of that? Uh, idea ed I, I don't agree with it um i think many people that propose that are coming from a position of they themselves how they would act in a situation but that's not that's teachers aren't signing up for this and and it sounds like it's it's a very easy fix but it's not you know if we if we don't have enough training for cops to handle these types of situations, how, how are we going to train teachers to do this? This is not their job. What I would suggest is, and something Tony pointed out, is the partnership with law enforcement and schools is huge, and, and we don't see enough of it. In fact, it's scary that, you know, over the past few years, we've seen schools pushing to have police out of schools. And, and I think this partnership is so important, and this, is, this case is a great example if an officer was in on this meeting that day, th these are the questions that officer would have been asked. And I, I can look at it from my perspective as an officer. The first question I would ask is, does that kid have access to a firearm? And would have never let, let him walk out without checking him, checking his backpack, checking his person, checking his locker. That would have been bread and butter for cops to do, you know, in that situation, to ask those types of questions. Does he have access to firearms? He was looking up ammunition, what's going on with this, and start pushing those questions, which may have led to a different outcome. And, and that's what's essential for this. You know, having a partnership with law enforcement and with schools, I think, is 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 key in this. Uh, and it's why, and as Tony mentioned, is is even part of how we want to respond to these types of threats to have law enforcement as part of it. And I can tell uh, just uh, looking at the, the chat that collectively, uh, almost across the board, no one believes that teachers, at least in this chat, should be armed. Wesley John Holmes making the point I made. He is an Aussie living in Tokyo. 
What have we become if we have to ask teachers to check a kid's backpack for a nine millimeter handgun? Just think about that for a moment. It's crazy. Um, this is school. Uh, we're all of a comp comparable generation. I, I went to high school in the 80s. There was a fight occasionally, never something that we had to worry about. And then since Columbine in 99, it seems like uh, there was a, a tectonic shift in uh, in all that. And it has gotten worse over time, not better. Uh, Lindsay Shea says, Tony's doing fantastic work for our schools and country. Thank you, Tony. Black Widow from the Republic of Ireland. Uh, what legislation needs to be put in place to give the school power in such circumstances to override uh, the parents' responsibility. That would have to be laws that are passed. Um, Tony, do you have another two minutes? Sure. Okay. I'm just going to play from today uh, the verdict, if I can find it here. Uh, this is the verdict. Let's watch it together. We'll get Tony's reaction. Then we'll let him go and the rest of the uh, panelists' reaction. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been informed that the verdict is that correct? That is correct. Um, are you the correct person? I am. Could you please uh, read your verdict? Um, individually? Sure. Okay. Um, on count one of involuntary manslaughter, as to Madison Baldwin, we find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter. On count two of involuntary manslaughter in regards to Tate Muir, we find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter. On count three, as to involuntary manslaughter regarding Hannah, Hannah St. Juliana, we find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter. And in count four of involuntary manslaughter against Justin Schilling, we find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Thank you for allowing me to see it. And I'm going to see the police hold the jury. Jury, see. I'm going to mute the rest. We can watch it. But uh, Tony, again, I'm sure you saw it earlier. Um, whatever anyone else says, um, I believe that this is a precedent setting case. Uh, you just saw four counts of involuntary manslaughter. This mother is now going to face prison time. Um, just your reaction to watching this now. Well, sadly, and all too often, we see firearms mishandled and not stored properly. And, and it results in the death of, uh, of many, many children. Uh, firearms are the leading cause in America right now, which is a sad statement. And a lot of that is due to uh, parents not being responsible firearms owners, not storing it someplace where it's not accessible by children, not uh, keeping it someplace where it's not going to be stolen and then it gets taken and used in a, in a, in a crime. Um, you know, I'm really uh, pleased to see some form of accountability, and I'm sure that the victim's families, although it in no way, shape or form, helps ease the pain of their loss but it does help to see some form of accountability, any form of accountability. Sadly, something the uh, jurors here in, uh, in South Florida did not do for our families in Parkland when it came to the, uh, the uh, death penalty for the shooter or for the uh, terrible actions of the school resource officer, the failed school resource officer, Scott Peterson. Um, so we're, we're pleased to see this form of accountability by holding people accountable, we're going to encourage people to say, hey, I better do something because I might be held accountable for the actions of my child if they are able to access a firearm and they go out and kill others. Tony, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate the time. Wildfire echoing my sentiments. Thank you, Tony, so much for your input. Uh, God bless your daughter, uh, Gina Rose. She is in our uh, thoughts. I wish there was more that we could do. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Take care. Dave Gorsica, um, we just saw uh, guilty on those four counts. Um, M. Christine right here. It's a polarizing case. She is not guilty. What do you say to M. Christine? I'm not sure um, M. Christine watched the entire trial and knows all the facts because there was plenty. Listen, there's plenty of red flags that were ignored by these parents starting back in March and April before the shooting occurred. And then to have the audacity or stupidity maybe as a better adjective to buy a, a, a son who was suffering from mental illness and they ignored it and give him the gun and the means to which to go into school and shoot 
and not only the four individuals that died, but six others that were seriously injured. Um, I think it was a just verdict based upon the facts. So, um, you know, when you talk about Josh precedent setting, I think it's only precedent setting um, insofar as that this is the first time parents have been held accountable for mass shooting. I don't think this creates a bright line rule, nor did I the court of appeal appeals rule that this was they created a bright line uh, ruling by allowing this to go to jury. I think it's factually driven uh, based upon the totality of circumstances and the red flags. No, no parents going to be charged with involuntary manslaughter, but for having knowledge about certain facts and circumstances. And in this case, the burden was really gross negligent, either failing to take an act or not taking an act at all. Um, and that's what the jury concluded, that they were grossly negligent in their duty and failure to carry out the duties. And David, uh, realistically, Ms. Crumbly, um, how much time is she facing now? I think it was up to 15 years, but what can we expect at sentencing? It, yes, the statutory maximum is 15 years. In Michigan, we used to have uh, sentencing guidelines, but the courts have held that those are guidelines only. The guidelines in this case, I think about four to five years. But having said that, uh, the trial judge can depart from those guidelines for substantial and compelling reasons. And in this case, I think there are many. So she can uh, go above the five years, all the way up to 15 if she wanted. Uh, and I think the judge will de will depart, but that's a little bit of speculation on my part. And, and that's, that's, I, per, yeah. that's per charge. I'm sorry. So could they run consecutive and not concurrently? Is that we? No, the, they will. They will run concurrently. Uh, okay. Each time. Okay. Uh, Josh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that was, that was my question. Cause I, I, I was looking through, you know, reports following this verdict to try to get an answer to that. And there, there's conflicting reports out there because I'm, I'm reading some that say, you know, there, she's looking at 15 years on each count, meaning, you know, a total of 60, no. but then you're saying that, no, the way this had actually worked is they're concurrent. That's correct. And that's why we've got Dave Gorska here. That's why we've got the best guests in all true crime, Josh Ritter, because uh, <laughs> we bring you the uh, prosecutor from the county where this all went down. Um, Raymond Weiss brings up a, a good point, and this always comes up. Uh, can we mention that not everyone with mental illness is violent? In fact, everywhere in the world has mentally ill people. It's just in the U.S. that it is so easy for them to buy a gun. Uh, the, the more important point is that the vast, 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 almost – you know, entire majority of mentally ill people do not commit violent crimes, but some who do are mentally ill. And I think that's, uh, you know, what, what's been stipulated here. Uh, Josh Ritter, this is uh, confusing to the lay people, uh, meaning everybody but you and, and David, but the jury came back with two questions. Um, are you surprised uh, that it took them 14 hours of deliberations? And that's, that's question number one. No, I, I I thought it was going to take them longer. I, I I I might be in the minority here, but I was actually surprised. Um, I thought we might see a, a hung jury in this case. I, I I I I hear everything that Dave is saying about the the egregious set of circumstances surrounding how these parents behaved and what they knew and the red flags that were blaring and and all of it. Um but it is such a unique question because you are still talking about somebody who acted independently and so you know he he did take it upon himself to go get that gun and to hide it in his backpack and take it to school and all of the steps that he had to take independent of his parents and of their knowledge and that's a difficult question um gross negligence uh you know is not is not something that you can just um, arrive at through mathematics. It's it's something that jurors are going to have to kind of arrive at through a holistic understanding of all the surrounding circumstances and all the evidence that was presented by the prosecution. So I thought it was something that they were going to um, really struggle with for some period of time. W w one interesting report I, I saw on this, though, was that uh, uh, one of the jurors said that one of the things they were concerned with was who was the last adult 
to handle that gun. And I know that that was evidence that came out by the prosecution that Jennifer Crumbly was the last adult to handle that gun. And I think that gives us a little bit of insight that they that was something that the jurors focused in on is the storage and the security of that gun. And if she's the responsible person, this is a minor and this is their child, they're responsible for how that gun is being kept at their home. And if she's the last person to have handled it and didn't secure it in a way, and he, with his mental health issues, was able to access it, um, that is, I think, something that the jurors may have hung their hats on. Uh, Spetty Ross, did uh, she or her husband uh, purchase the gun? They did get the gun uh, for their son. I think it was uh, an early Christmas present. And I think it was four days uh, before the shooting happened. It was a six hour, nine millimeter. Uh, Ed McGovern, this is the $64,000 question, but it's the one everyone asks, why, why are we so violent in this country? You look at other countries, uh, it's not even close. The number of mass shootings, the number of school shootings, uh, you obviously were in law enforcement. You were part of a SWAT team. You put your life on the line for your community. Uh, but why is it so violent? Do you have a theory? Well, there's a number of factors um, that we can look at. I, I think in general, um, we just seem to have this indifference now. Um, and we just have, have become accustomed to accepting violence and then it's just continued on, you know, when we talk about when we see violence all over our country, not just as in these mass shootings, but just in, in, in other crimes. And, and we just kind of take it now, like it's acceptable. Uh, I think now especially is, is going to be a, a pivotal point, you know, for us as a nation with watching law enforcement you know just it, it seems to be deteriorating you know not nobody really wants to be a cop anymore um and, and I, I think i brought this up you know I, I think they're making the job so impossible that it's just nobody's going to want to do it and we've seen the staffing shortages everywhere and that's that's really what is going to cause a lot more violent uprisings we've seen it in places where defund the police have happened and you just see crime skyrocket because we are this line between good people and good citizens and, and the violent you know criminals that are out there um and and the less we're out there the less we're proactive the less we're you know wanting to go out there and and risk it all it just opens the door for criminals to just you know, do whatever they want. And, and I think this is this is why we're, we're seeing this rise. And, and it's just, uh, it, it's sad to see coming from law enforcement, you know, it's a profession that I loved. I, I think uh, we really need to start looking at this and we really start, need to start as a country, stop bickering about things that are, that are just really not important and, and really start to come together on, on addressing the violence issue in our country because it's just it's it's out of hand now it, it it really is and you know unless we unless we you know provide both police we provide mental health we provide a, a lot of things and we start taking it seriously it's just going to continue to just go up uh, and I, it really feels like it's only gotten worse I covered Sandy Hook Elementary which was you know, just unbearable, uh, the age of those kids, uh, misdemeanor OG. Uh, this is where it becomes a little bit of a slippery slope. David Gorska, our parents going to be held accountable for stabbings too, assaults, selling and using drugs in school. Um, how are they going to discern this in a court of law of who should be held responsible and who shouldn't when it comes to bad parenting, David? You know, I, again, this is factually driven. I don't think there would have been a prosecution but for the parents um, ignoring all these red flags and then buying their, their son a gun. Um, you know, was it foreseeable that this could have happened? Yes, uh, I think so. And that's what the jury concluded. But I don't think, I, I, don't, I, I know not every parent will be held accountable unless there are specific factual red flags or something to prove that the parents had some type of knowledge 
that their kid had either suicidal homi uh, homicidal ideations or was mentally ill and then you know you'd have to buy them the knife or whatever a uh, means that would be utilized or the drugs to go to school but i don't think it sets a precedent in that fashion the the court of appeals said we're not by allowing this case to go to trial they specifically said we are not creating a bright line rule where parents can be held criminally culpable for the actions of their children in every case um josh ritter it, it got a little confusing here but basically the state had uh they introduced two different theories uh that could have satisfied the involuntary manslaughter charges and the jury had to agree that the prosecution proved at least one of the two theories uh and one of them had to do with failure to perform a legal duty and the other um is gross negligence david gorska talked about this a little bit off the top can you break that down a little bit just to explain in layman's terms what that really means yeah so what the prosecution was able to do was present two alternative theories to arrive at involuntary manslaughter but the jurors were not required to though they're required to be unanimous in their verdict that it is uh involuntary manslaughter they're not required to be unanimous in what avenue they arrived at involuntary manslaughter so if they decided to go by you know failure to uh um failure in a duty i, I forget the, the way you outlined it or by the avenue of gross negligence some jurors could have felt that it was gross negligence others could have felt there was a failure in a duty that they owed uh to those um those those victims um and they didn't have to agree on that as long as they both agree that as long as all 12 of them agreed that they arrived at that involuntary manslaughter at the end of their deliberations um and that's what they did here and so that's why um uh you know it, did you want me to go into kind of what the idea of gross negligence is sure if you yeah yeah it, it, it i mean basically negligence is a term that's used throughout the law it's used even in in the civil world we we oftentimes see it there and it, negligence has to do with the idea that you have some sort of responsibility towards others in some sort of way and that you are you are failing to reach that duty you you know we see it a lot of times we talk about um you know uh if you don't have proper safety precautions at, at, at in the way that your your home is set up you know you don't have a banister on your staircase or something like that uh, they that that could be viewed as negligence for the safety of others and if somebody falls and hurts themselves that you might be held responsible you're negligent for the way that you um uh, the duty that you had to protect others in criminal negligence, though, we go into this idea of gross negligence, and it involves the idea of um, willfully disregarding things. And that's what this case came down to, really, is the, the idea of one um, foreseeability. W was it reasonably foreseeable to these parents, given all the circumstances, given all the evidence, given all the red flags, that something like this could have happened? And if so, did they fail? to did they willfully ignore that in a, in a gross manner in a way that was negligent beyond simple negligence that we should hold them criminally responsible and um the prosecution put on a lot of evidence that that seemed to uh show that not only you know were the parents um aware of the condition of their their child but the way that they stored that gun, the, the, I think that the mere purchasing of the gun is probably a, a point that that shows uh, some indifference towards the safety of others. The, the, to me, that was, I think, a crucial element. Maybe maybe Dave has some more insight on this, but I think that was a crucial element in why the prosecution decided that this was factually different than other cases we've seen before, because this kid didn't go out and purchase this gun on his own. He didn't go steal it from somewhere. They purchased it for him, knowing that he was struggling with the problems that he had. And that introduction of the weapon, I think, is the part that everyone decided to take a closer look at this case and, just, and say, is this a case that we're going to actually charge the parents for holding them responsible for the deaths of others? Uh, David, anything you want to add to that? I, no, I think... Uh... 
Josh has a very fair assessment, but what other um, aspect was that they, um, while the, the mother took him to the range a couple days before and was last seen with the gun, it was the father who had the responsibility of storing it. He did not store it were in a safe um, and it, um, and there was no gun lock, even though it came with a gun lock. A gun lock was not used. The mother hid the ammunition in a drawer, which was easy to find and access. So he had easy access to the gun and the ammunition. And I think that also goes towards the gross negligence point where had they stored it correctly in a locked safe and, and, and the ammunition been stored or locked too, this could have been very preventable. Okay. Uh, just a very quick programming note before I forget. Tomorrow, 8.50 in the morning, we're going to be live on this channel. Uh, and We're going to bring you Shanna Gardner, uh, very similar to the Dan Markell Adelson case. Uh, she's the ex-wife of Jared Bridegan, uh, conspired, charged with cons conspiring to kill her ex-husband in a murder-for-hire plot. She's back in court tomorrow. We're going to cover that uh, 9 a.m., starting at 8.50 a.m., and then at 5 p.m. Eastern tomorrow, we are going to have the body language expert of all experts, Dr. G, explain some of the Michelle Traconis uh, movements uh, in her video in that trial that's happening in Stamford, Connecticut. Uh, so both those shows tomorrow. Um, David, I don't want to put you in a tough spot there because you're in Oakland County and it's not that big. But any thoughts on Shannon Smith, the defense attorney here? Myself and a lot of people thought she behaved unprofessionally and childishly at times, even crying, requesting breaks. It was embarrassing. Uh, she did talk about her own messy life up there. This is the defense attorney uh, for Jennifer Crumbly. Uh, she even went uh, so far as to say that she doesn't have time to shower herself. Uh, that she just uses uh, wipes at times, uh, that she understands how frenetic and hectic it is being a parent and that she would never blame Jennifer. What what did you think of her uh, defense tactics? Some people are saying uh, already ineffective counsel. What say you? I can't disagree. I think <laughs> there's quite a few arguments to be made for ineffective assistance of counsel. And what I mean by that is she, the attorney, Shannon Smith, filed several motions eliminating, meaning motions before the trial to exclude certain pieces of evidence. She got those rulings and then during the trial did a 180 and reverse course a number of times, I think three or four times about now telling the judge, no, we want it all to come in. Um, I think there was 3000 Facebook posts she tried to keep out, those all came in. More importantly, she tried to keep the affair out and then said, no judge, we want it in. And then we learned on cross-examination that they were using some app to find, you know, threesomes. Um, I think that was all very damaging when, when she trift, uh, shifted trial tactics in the middle of the trial. Um, I think that was dangerous course for her. Um, and also, if any of you watched it, I think she said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, a thousand times. When you're advocating for your client, you don't want to apologize for anything. You want to be a strong, zealous advocate up there for your client. I think it came off very clumsy, and I agree, at times, very unprofessional. Uh, Bill Davis I, with the super I, chat. Go ahead, Josh. I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to jump in on uh, to add to what Dave said. Um, not to pile on this attorney, but one of the things that, to me, was just unacceptable was early on in the trial, they showed a video of a, inside of the school and it, it apparently evoked a very emotional response from the defendant and and apparently from the defense attorney as well and there was discussion outside of the presence of the jury about this and the defense attorney said i've never watched this video i so we were both watching it for the first time in court and that's why we were res responding so emotionally to it and when asked why she hadn't watched it, she said something along the lines of it. Well, it's not pertinent to our case. My client wasn't there. This wasn't important to us. And to me, that was just unacceptable. I don't care what your theory of the case is as a defense attorney. You have to review everything, especially going into a trial of this magnitude. And I just felt that, um, you know, whenever the, the attorney is starting to become this topic of conversation is something that people, the media 
courtroom observers are talking about, that's a problem. That that they should never though they're though they're the ones speaking and the ones kind of in the spotlight, they should not be stealing the spotlight from the evidence and facts in the case. She even at one time said, I think something fell and she said, Oh, I should kill myself or something like that in front of the jury. And the judge admonished her uh, for doing that. And even before the trial started, the judge said to the parties, in, including the detectives and law enforcement, that she would she admonish them. I really don't want any emotion in this trial. And yet a lot of it came out uh, from the, de de the defense attorney. It, it was not a good look. Um, and I, I think I hope it doesn't come back on ineffective assistance grounds, but I'm fearful it may. And uh, yeah, it sounds like it might. Someone was asking, David, if uh, Jennifer could be sentenced to time served. Is that a possibility? It is. Uh, I think she's been incarcerated now for about two, maybe a little over two years, but highly unlikely. She hasn't even served uh, the minimum under the sentencing guidelines. And I suspect, and I, I maybe I, sh I shouldn't, uh, I shouldn't speak for the trial judge, but I think the trial judge may go beyond the guidelines. Well, and, and you, you can do that. You can go be, I didn't know you could do that. Yes. Yeah, as if, if the judge feels that there's substantial and compelling reasons to go outside the guidelines, she can delineate those on the record, make a record of it and go beyond the minimum sentence under our current Michigan law. Wow. Okay. Uh, Bill Davis with the super chat here. This wasn't a case where the child was was living a secret, concealed double life, like in Columbine. This case was no different than a parent observing that their child was heavily intoxicated and they gave him uh, the car keys. Um, Ed, talk to us a little bit. Um, we'll, we'll do a full show on this, but tell us a little bit about your software and uh, why it might help. In the next, in the case of another, or I should say, the next school shooting, because I think it's inevitable that there will be another one. Sadly, sadly, yes, there will be. And and, and really quick to what Bill Davis put up there, and he's right. You know, and, and not not only is it that, but we see how many of these shootings happen that, you know, and it just follows this pattern. You know, we 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 can't be looking at this and saying, oh, I, I didn't expect this to happen when you when you we've been shown this pattern over and over again. Uh, as, as far as, as the software, we're, we're trying to save time. Every second that we are on a scene that we could save, saves lives. You know, it's the faster we can get to a shooter, the faster we can instigate a confrontation with that shooter and neutralize that threat, the less casualties we're going to have. And the casual, casualties we do have, we'll be able to save because we're getting to them faster. Um, that, was, that was the goal. When uh, I started Sarah, which I actually started before Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, so it was after the Fort Lauderdale Airport shooting. Uh, and then after MSD, I just looked for the opportunity to retire to to do this full time. But and that's the key, you know, and, and in many of my talks, people are very surprised to hear that 90 percent of the police departments in this country are less than 50 officers. And those are the ones that are facing a lot of these events. And they're usually priced out of technology. They're priced out of training. They're priced out of any type of help for a mutual aid event when, that they mostly need, where they need a multi-agency response. And that's what we look to, to change with Sarah. We created this for those types of departments. Uh, Barb Nauman here with a super chat here. The key to this tragic trend begins in the home and with the parents. The family unit is largely fractured in many segments of our society with absent or dysfunctional parents. Children are suff suffering. Many are lost and angry. And I say it again, I think it's getting worse, um, not better. Uh, but again, kudos to uh, Ed for at least looking um, for a solution here. Dwayne Harrison, when you see the software, uh, you'll be amazed uh, by what, what it does. Dwayne Harris coming to us uh, from Detroit uh, with the uh, ten dollar super sticker so thank you um just looking at some of the missed signs josh ritter uh eight months before the shooting ethan crumbly texted that he could see demons or clothes flying from shelves and asked his mother to respond to him she said that she thought he was just joking and that uh he was joking about the house being 
haunted. And then just again, four days before the shooting, she goes out and buys him a gun. Um, silly question maybe, but you know, mental illness is obviously a serious, serious disease. And how, um, culpable should parents be i mean how careful do parents need to be in watching these kind of trigger warnings i mean if my kid's telling me that sheets are moving and they're seeing demons i'm going to be really um you know on high alert i'm going to be looking for for help obviously jennifer didn't do that um but how do we i don't know how do we moderate that how do we fix that problem to make sure parents are doing their job as parents is that for me? Yes, sir. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, God, that's a good question. And it's such a difficult question. Uh, you know, I, I think, I think what this case presents, um, is a scenario where it's not just that parents were aware that their child was suffering from mental illness, um, you know, hallucinating about things, um, fixated on death, their own death, other people's deaths, uh, uh, all of these things that I think even individually would be alarming to a parent, uh, put all together is something that you would certainly expect a, a, a caring and loving parent to want to get their, their, their child some sort of help. But beyond all that, it, it, you know, to, to answer your question, I think any parent should be viewing this and going, I need to be concerned about my child because here's a situation where parents I don't think um, either didn't care or 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 didn't ever think that their child could do something horrible and that this answers that question that these children are capable of really really horrific things but where this case I think distinguishes itself and and if you want to say use that term put parents on notice is, when you're dealing with that situation, should you be trying to get them help? Yes. Should you be uh, forthcoming with the school about the situation? Yes. Should you be, uh, you know, putting this as a priority in your life? Yes. But on top of that, you should be, you should not be supplying them with a weapon and you should not have a weapon accessible in that home. And if you do have a weapon, then that should be secured in some sort of way. And I really think that that is the takeaway for most parents here is that that's what that's what distinguishes this case is that they had a troubled child thousands of parents are dealing with that in this country but they had a troubled child and then they allowed him to have access to a weapon in a way that was negligent and grossly negligent according to the prosecution that then led to the loss of lives yeah and um i saw someone i think it was uh Tammy in Mexico saying that that's why she doesn't have kids. She doesn't want the responsibility. And I have to tell you, having kids is a massive responsibility. I got little ones, but um, think about it all the time. Uh, the COE, the chief of everything, reminded me we do have I was so engrossed in the conversation. I almost forgot. Here's a little bit of testimony from Jennifer Crumbly on the stand. Uh, we'll go over a couple more things and uh, we'll wrap the show in a little bit. Here we go. Here's some testimony. I don't know how to describe it. It's just that point in time, I just, I just kind of felt like somewhere I failed. Do you believe there was anything? Um, do you believe that you knew or had reason to know your son was a danger to anyone else? No. Um, as a parent, you spend your whole, your whole life trying to protect your your child from other dangers. Um, you never. You never would think you'd have to protect your child from harming somebody else. That's what that's what blew my mind. I just I, that was the hardest thing I had to <coughs> to stomach is that my child har harmed and kill other people. Do you believe there were things you were thinking at the time? I should do this, but I'm not doing it. Do you look back and think that? No, I don't. I mean, I of course I look back after this all happened, and um, I've asked myself if I would have done anything differently, and I wouldn't have. <clears throat> if you could change what happened, would you? Oh, absolutely. I wish he would have killed us instead. Uh, Ed McGovern, 
Um, she said she wouldn't have uh, done things differently, but wish that he killed the parents. What do you think watching that? It's crazy. Um, you know, it's the one thing she was right about. She did fail. You know, it's just there's no other way around it. it you know, when you see, uh, I was particularly shocked seeing some of the text messages between her and her son and seeing that, you know, and, and seeing the other messages where they, they just don't seem to take a parent role anywhere. You know, when he was, uh, when the shooter was caught the day before looking up ammunition at school and the school called the parents, her message to her son after was, you got to learn how to do that without getting caught. You know, it's, that's, it's kind of disturbing. It, you know, you're basically letting him off the hook for something he did wrong in school. There was a, a violation in school. You're letting him off the hook. And, and it, it's almost like she wants to be his friend more than being a parent, you know, and I think both of them really had this lackadaisical, not involved type attitude. Um, so they are responsible. We all are as parents. We understand these these rules no different than if we, you know, and I think one of your your followers mentioned it, you know, you hand your your keys to your kid, to, you know, to drive a car, you, anything you're doing, you're responsible for your kid, you know, and, and if all of this, this kid's messages uh, and and what he said to his parents and, and what he's doing in school and what he's drawing are not indicators or what not you have a school telling you that there's something wrong here everything Ed, everyone's if, telling you something's wrong and they're just ignoring it yeah what we talked about arming teachers and it seemed to be uh, an idea no one liked but what about um magnetometers or metal detectors in schools listen it's unfortunate and, and a lot of times and this kind of also goes back to a lot of schools not wanting law enforcement in their schools either is they they don't want this type of an environment you know but look it's a reality now as much as that that's an inconvenience as much as it may not make a kid feel great or the parents don't feel great you know nothing feels worse than going through this um and we need to we need to get away from that like we need to stop coddling everybody and and pretending like it's just not going to happen you know you have you know everyone people complain about having you know drills for for an active shooter they complain about having metal detectors they complain about having police and they think if it just if it's not there it's not going to happen and, and that's a big big mistake um there's plenty of ways to do this uh that are sensible that make sense uh you know and and, and weigh freedoms and liberties and and how a kid's going to feel up against safety you know we we need to take this seriously we can't see this happen over and over and over again and just do nothing it's infuriating to watch yeah um listener says as a society we glorify guns and sometimes stigma uh, stigmatize mental health and we wonder why we keep having school shootings followed by jess in california are we taking into account the social awkwardness of an ostracized child bullied at school, but is otherwise normal at home? Isn't this a causational factor outside parental control? I don't think he was acting very normal at home, but uh, in the case that someone is, I think that could be a problem. Uh, David, uh, back to you, and then we'll begin to wrap up here. Uh, I don't think a lot of people know all the facts, but the day before the uh, shooting, the school called to say, that uh, Ethan was looking up information on ammunition. He was doing that in class. And the mother, her response was basically, don't get caught when the school informed her of that. Instead of giving uh, good parental advice, she said, don't get caught. Uh, he said that my thoughts won't stop, quote unquote, the world is dead. These are a ton of warning signs that were just flat out missed. And David, is that why we are here where we're at today? I think so. I think, uh, again, this is factually driven and this is the case was formulated looking at the red flags, buying the gun. And was it foreseeable that taking in conjunction those two aspects was a foreseeable he go to school and either harm himself or others? I think absolutely. Uh, one other point, you know, I think one of you asked a question about 
the mom on cross exam or direct exam says testified that oh we were just joking around about the hallucina hallucinations and demons and him wanting to go see a doctor well he texted his very best friend said i want to see a doctor but my parents don't want me to go and i'll get in trouble if i do call 911 so it wasn't a joke to him uh, reaching out to his best friend and then dad's you know saying suck it up and mom laughing it off so it's a confluence of a lot of facts that really led to this conviction. Uh, Ed McGovern is a friend of mine, a personal friend. He's doing really amazing work with his software company, Sarah, C-E-R-A. Uh, you can check it out online. He's a former major in the Hallandale Beach Police Department, a former member of uh, SWAT. There's data out here, uh, Ed, that shows um, that securing weapons uh, always curbs the flow of weapons used by children in a majority of school shootings. A Washington Post review found more than 180 shootings committed by juveniles since Columbine, that in 180 of those shootings since then, a weapon was found in the home of relatives or friends. 86% of the time that was not secured. Um, is one of the problems just simply to make sure Guns are locked and safe and stored away, Ed McGovern. I think it's part of it. Look, it, it ha you have to look at it from from an, you know a lot of different perspectives. Number one is is safety and safe storage of firearms. That's huge. You also have to really you know be watching and monitoring you know your kids, their behavior, if they're you know showing that they have some type of issues. Uh, and then third is also educating your kids with firearms if you're going to have a firearm in the home. Uh, you know, listen, I, I I spent, you know, over two decades in law enforcement. I started in law enforcement before I even had kids. So my kids, from the time they were born, were raised in a home where there's guns because I was in law enforcement. And it's, it's a constant, you know, state of vigilance uh, as a parent, you know, both in educating your kids over the dangers uh, and what to do if they see a firearm, what they, what to do if they see somebody else with a firearm, uh, keeping your firearms safely stored and, and then also monitoring behavior of, of your kids. Um, those are the three things that are needed, but yeah, I mean, when you see, you know, this is just a flagrant violation with the access to a firearm, um, yeah, it's a big part. You know, you, we, we can't get away from the fact that, you know, it's just the, the free free access to a kid um, is is just, you know, it just fast tracks these types of incidents. Uh, Tony Montal, uh, Montalto joined us earlier on. He is uh, the father of uh, forever 14 year old Gina Rose uh, Montalto, who was a victim at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Uh, this is a photo of his daughter who will never be with him again because of mass shootings. Tony's the president of Stand with Parkland, uh, an organization that is doing uh, phenomenal work. Josh Ritter, um, prosecutor of the year in 2015, now part of the El Dabe Ritter trial lawyers firm and the host of True Crime Daily, the sidebar. Josh Ritter, in your opinion, uh, does this change the playing field moving forward when it comes to parents' responsibility in school shootings? Um, I think it's I think it's certainly a, a, a warning signal of that. I think it's I think it's a I think that it's a conversation that's being had uh, about that across the country. I, I that's why I think it is important for us to have these types of discussions because the more we have them the more that we're realizing that there there is not a one size fits all answer to solving this epidemic of of shootings and that there's a lot of different things that we need to take a look at we need to take a look at um you know the the safe storage and and handling of weapons we need to take a look at mental health we need to take a look at parenting and that that you know we 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 seem to uh, unfortunately, uh, politically, uh, retreat to our respective camps and corners when these types of things happen and people go back to the same, uh, kind of arguments that they've made in the past about what needs to be done. But 
a lot of things need to be done and uh, the continuing of that discussion, including um, the parent's role, I think is important. And so I think more than anything, that's what this case stands for is that, hey, by the way, you do have a role. It's very important. And if you neglect that to the point of criminality, you will be held responsible for it. Uh, Dave Gorska is a former uh, prosecutor in Oakland County and now a criminal defense attorney. Um, David, I was reading some uh, commentary on this and uh, Evan Burnick, who's a law professor at Northern Illinois University College of Law. He says that he thinks that this is going to now affect uh, poor parents and parents of color the most and went on to say that hard cases like this make bad law. And then we've got a guy named Randy Zellin, who's a Cornell law professor, very bright guy. And he says that the law is not supposed to be emotional. It should be neutral and detached. Um, are we veering off that course with this um, verdict today and your final thoughts? I don't think so. And I agree with Josh to an extent that this places parents on notice. One, I think be vigilant about their mental health status and well-being. Two, be extra vigilant about the safe storage of your handgun if you do have one in a household with minors. That's the message. Be on notice. Failure to, to protect or um, notice red flags and then arm your child with a gun, I think it sends a message that you might be accountable. But I don't think this is precedent setting where every prosecutor throughout the and across the country is now going to charge parents uh, and be criminally responsible for the actions of their child unless they have notice uh, of certain facts and circumstances that might be foreseeable where their child could perpetrate a heinous crime. Uh, an amazing panel tonight, a very difficult conversation, a very polarizing conversation one that we are definitely going to continue, also one that's just very difficult to speak about, especially when you have the parent of a child who was lost uh, in a school shooting. Kudos to guys like Ed McGovern who uh, faced the danger head on, who go to those shootings, uh, all the first responders out there. Uh, these are the victims, Hannah St. Juliana, Tate Meyer, Justin Schilling, Madison Baldwin. We love you. Love you, America. Love you, Oakland County, Michigan panelists. Hang on one second as we say goodbye.